everyone. I think, uh, again, I'm still going to try and finish this as close to nine o'clock as possible, but also yeah. devoting the uh, appropriate amount of time to matters of uh, great interest to all of us, I'm sure. So I'm going to pass on to Jane to talk about the Constituency Manager's Progress Report. Jane. Thanks, Chair. Um, as always, um, I um, prepare a uh, report for the committee on uh, the various initiatives that we've been involved in and the use of the committee's budget. Um, I'll run very, very briefly um, through this uh, in time constraints, but just to point out a couple of things that we've been doing. Um, as you came in this, uh, this evening, um, you will have seen the presentation about our special places project, which we've had a great response to. Um, and this is about identifying locations across the constituency for the installation of new benches. Um, people seem to have really warmed to that idea. So we've had people sending in lots of photographs, which has been great. Um, that closes at the end of February. Um, because the committee won't meet now for a while, um, the April meeting that was scheduled is, is not going ahead because of considerations of PERDA. Um, what I'm proposing is that we convene a, a panel of uh, members, one member per ward, to look at these suggestions and, and make their decisions. We'll need to do some sort of feasibility assessment of locations as well prior to that, in conjunction with the chair. Yes, chair. Um, um, the other point to make about that project, um, and it's a, a funding issue, is that when we um, uh, drew up this project, when we were, were looking at how it might work, we uh, allocated 5,000 from a previous uh, budget allocation to do this. Um, looking at the response that we've had, um, you can never tell how much uh, people can respond to, to some of these engagement projects, and we have had a really good response. So we would like to maximise um, the number of new benches we can install, but we recognise that the money that we've got might um, there might be a bit of a shortfall, dependent on installation and things like um, if the special circumstances. Um, so what I'm asking the committee to uh, agree is that um, from a separate budget allocation, which is uh, an environmental budget for this year, which is 10,000 that we haven't actually allocated as yet, is that we ring fence some of that money to ensure that we can um, put these benches in place, uh, a maximum of 2,000 from that budget, and that's set out in the recommendation. Is that, is that okay with everyone? Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, there's uh, just an update on the Safe Home and Well project, which we've been involved in now for a couple of years. Um, I'm sorry, I haven't see, seen that. Um, but this is about adding value to existing activity, particularly with our colleagues in the Fire and Rescue Service. Um, there's quite a lot of detail in report about um, our antisocial behaviour budget. Um, we, uh, again, we have a panel of members that come together to, to look at the issues across the constituency and come up with some proposals. The key one that uh, we're working on at the moment is looking at the reinvigoration of neighbourhood watch schemes. Um, we know we've got a number in the, in the constituency area, so we want to do some really localised work to reinvigorate those, um, get the people who are involved together and also see if we can uh, initiate some new schemes. Um, so that is kind of the next big campaign that we're working on. Um, and as, as I say, there's a lot of detail around um, the constituency hotspot hot for antisocial behaviour as Woodchurch, and alongside some of the work, some of the work that we've put in place, which is um, sports sessions uh, on weekends to see if, if that can address some, some of those issues. Um, there's been a lot of um, targeted activity by Merseyside Police colleagues recently. That's detailed in the report, uh, and that's linked to the use of a piece of legislation called the dispersal zone. Um, as I say, if, if you, please do read at that, but if you have any questions about the impact of that, which has been significant, I think, or it has been uh, worked well, we've got Inspector Griffiths from Merseyside Police, so he can answer any questions uh, in the question time or after this report. Um, can, our core constituency budget um, is used for a grants programme called Community Fund, and that's currently open for applications. They are coming in by the, uh, by the day, so I think... Helen might be able to say how many, but I think we've probably had well over 20 already, so, and the deadline's not till the end of February. Again, we'll do a community vote on that to support um, the project, um, and I'm asking um, that the committee gives delegated authority to ward councillors to agree the final list of, of projects for community fund grants. Okay, just check that. That's okay with everyone, we all agree. <coughs> Um, moving on to the environmental budget, um, this was um, in the council's budget for this year around community cleanups, but can be arranged for use for a, a range of issues. 
Um, and what I'm asking for here is, uh, we haven't um, allocated that as yet, but again, could we set up a panel of, of members, um, one member per ward, to look at um, spending that money equitably across the <coughs> constituency? Obviously, that takes into account that it will be um, slightly reduced should we use some money for benches. Um, quick update on road safety budget. Um, we haven't. Um, we have a new allocation this year, and the panel met quite recently to look at an, a list of schemes. This was a very long list of possible schemes, and some of those have come through from residents. Some of them um, have come through from members. Uh, there's a variety of, of uh, avenues uh, which we've had those. So we've looked through those, and now they're the ones that are being taken forward are being costed and investigated. So no decisions on that as yet, but we'll keep. Obviously, keep um, updated through the committee. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you. Um, and again, just on behalf of all of us, um, just want to thank Jane and the and the team for the work that they do. There's only two, isn't there? And you, you do get a huge, and, you, know, you get a huge amount of work um, work done, and, and add huge amounts of value with relatively small amounts of money to to the community and the area. And I'm, you know, I'm sure we all want to place on record our thanks to you for that. And again, <laughs> got the family in. Um, and, yes. <laughs> so, and, and again, particularly, I, I know it's uh, the Stay Safe, Warm and Well project. It, you know, that was your idea. You came to us with it, saying something that could uh, really make a difference. Very limited amounts of money. Um, so, fantastic job and well done. So, if we move on, the next one on the agenda, and I do apologise for uh, rushing through some of this, but we have a, an update on the West Kirby flood alleviation proposals. And I think, Jane, are you going to give a yeah, short, short. short presentation? Do you want to take this with you? I'll keep this very brief, but um, I just wanted to update the committee um, and also take into account the fact we're in um, West Kirby this evening and I know a lot of residents of West Kirby and this area will be interested in this as an item, is that um, we've done a lot of work in the area recently to um, work with colleagues in other departments of the council to engage with people about some proposals for alleviating flood risk in West Kirby. Um, I would stress that I am not a technical expert when it comes to matters of, of flood alleviation or indeed some of the technical aspects of the scheme. Um, but what we've been involved in is what we've called pre-planning engagement, so to ask people their broad views about um, what we want, what we want to do uh, in terms of alleviating the risk. Yeah, but you're standing in front of the camera. Oh, okay. Um, Um, just, just um, some of you will be familiar with this, residents, uh, residents of, of West Kirby. Um, in terms of the serious um, flooding that we had in December 2013, um, South Korea did suffer uh, some extensive damage um, during that uh, particular um, winter season, and a number of properties did uh, suffered internal flooding at that time. So it's just a reminder really of the context of why the council started to look at this. It was already identified as a priority in our coastal um, uh, plan, our coastal strategy, um, and the, inc the, the incidents and the um, issues in, in that, at that time brought it forward. So um, these slides are racing ahead. So, so there's obviously some time on there. So um, what we wanted to do was we wanted to engage with people to ensure that people understood the risk. And clearly there's a, a, a lot of people who are very, um, have a very deep understanding of, of how it happens and why. Um, just going to move on to that slide, see if it works. Do apologise. No, it's not going to work. I'm just going to move it slightly. <laughs> um, so what we did was we had a very a short engagement period, maybe two weeks, where we had a, an information leaflet that was available, we had a feedback form, and what that um, information leaflet outlined was context of why we wanted to look at alleviating the flood risk and also the council's preferred option at this stage which is this the um, um, building of a, a flood defence structure on the promenade. Um, a lot of detail work has gone into preparing what is known as a project appraisal report so all of that information is, um, is, is coming together now but this was this is and this was part of um, bringing that report together. 
Um, we had a good response, we had some drop-in sessions and an exhibition in Morrison's and also in the library. And about 400 people got back to us with their views, um, which was a, we thought was a really good response, right, given it was a very targeted piece of work. Um, most people want the council to do something about alleviating the flood risk, taking into account those, lots of those long-term projections as well, that it will is likely um, to get um, you know, worse and those incidents may be, become more regular over time. Um, and most of the people who said they wanted us to do something supported the idea of a structure. Now, it's very important to say that people express concerns as well, and not everybody is supportive of doing something so significant in terms of changing the public realm at West Kirby. Um, but what this gave us was an early indication of how people feel about that, what those concerns were, and as you can imagine, they were around the view, um, around the impact on the feel of West Kirby and the promenade, um, and, and you know, another other issue, parking came up quite a lot in what people fed back to us. Um, we brought copies tonight of the report of that, which uh, I think Helen's got some copies on the table. We can send you that, it's on our website. Um, that's quite a short report, but it's an attempt to try and sort of get the flavour of what people were saying, and that will be fed into um, the project appraisal report that's now being finalised. There's work to be done with the Environment Agency to secure funding, so it's still early days, um, and we're, we're not in the uh, realm of um, statutory planning as yet, so there will be a lot more detail on this. But um, what's one, been one of the great things that have come out of it is um, we have had a really, really um, good dialogue, I think, with the community and residents, and a number of them are sort of coming together to hopefully work with us much more closely on, on flood resilience, and a couple of them are with us tonight, and we've, that, that's been really fantastic because um, it's not just about um, the council putting this in place and, and sort of trying to work through the planning process, but what's, um, this, is, this is a massive uh, impact on the community. West Kirby is, um, you know, in terms of the public realm, so the more input we can get into the design of the scheme as it moves forward, um, as we shape the proposals, that's great. Um, and the more people can do themselves in terms of flood resilience, obviously is fantastic. So I want to put on record thanks to those residents and the name, <laughs> Linda and, um, and Brian, um, and just say thank you for, for actually supporting us with this work. So it's, it's more to come then. <laughs> well, well done. Uh, thank you. Conscious that we need to uh, to make progress, but are there any questions or comments arising out of that, colleagues? People will have an op I mean, for the committee, we'll have a couple of questions on that. So, any comments? No? Okay. Uh, thank you. Yeah. So, um, so, okay. Thank you for that. Item of the agenda. Well, Jeff, can I say something? Well, is this just about West Kirby this month? That's particularly, I think the clue was in the toilet, it's the West Kirby flood relief. Uh, well, I take it it's tidal flood relief. Yes, yes. Yeah. But what about the likes of Morton, which is, was flooded at the same time? Why aren't they getting all this, these millions pumped into it? Um, what's happening currently is. Um, I'm not sure whether Morton flooded in December 2013 or what. I wasn't involved in this. But in West Kirby is tidal. Twice a year you'll get a spring yeah, tide yeah. that will come up there. We've had some recent, we had some recent flooding in, in, in a number of parts of the borough. And I know that the, um, we have a statutory duty to do a invest, full investigation, which is uh, happening at the moment. So it's not like there's the, the, only the focus on, on, on West Kirby. This is uh, you know, an, a, a sort of one project in a, in a raft of... Um, work that, that is done by the coastal so team. What I'm trying to say, James, is, and it's got it up there, once in a generation you'll get that. Where there's Morton and places around the, around the borough are getting flooded regular now. Okay. And 
Well, it, well, it is actually, because as I've said to you in the that. past, it's a, it's a meeting held in public, not a public meeting. The longer this takes, the less chance we have to ask questions in the public question time section. I understand your concern, and we will make sure, because again, there's concerns people got, Pensby, um, Barnston, and, and, and what have you. That was specifically, that, that was a specific item on the agenda uh, that we asked it to be, because again, it is something, as you can see from the consultation, there's been a lot of effort, and as Elizabeth pointed out, it's been an example of good, uh, of good practice. What I'm going to move on to is updates from community representatives. Um, and people may have seen we've been advertising for new representatives to come along uh, to be, or application, not new, but applications to become community representatives. And they've got out this week and we've been advertising. Uh, one of the things I do need to note and want to share with the committee is that while existing community reps are welcome to reapply, John Smith, um, Greasby Frank Binerby community rep, has indicated that he won't be applying again. And I think, as, and I'm sure you're devastated about that, John, aren't you? Um, I, I think what we'd like to do, I'm sure on behalf of everyone, we'd like to thank John for his service. Always the voice of reason, always listened to in silence, so never interrupted by the, uh, by the audience. Uh, you're going to have to come and give me a bit of a, um, a, a master class of tutorial around, uh, around that. If you, you don't mind. So, uh, John, thank you very much for your service. It really is appreciated. Whilst you might not be on the committee, I know that you'll be carrying on doing sensational community work. So, thank you for that. Uh, Jackie and John, um, gosh, reminds me of a book. Uh, so, uh, we've got 10 minutes. Do you want to update on what's been happening in, uh, in Hoylake and in Greasby? Um, I have voiced my opinions before about the question time uh, and as a result of that I did tell you that I would be organising for the residents of Hoylake Ward uh, residents meetings. We held our first one uh, in November and that was before the consultation started for the golf resort. We held our own meeting which was very well attended. Since then we've had a meeting uh, about the demolition of the church in, in Hoylake, which we're concerned about. And our next residence meeting will be held on the 21st of March, when new issues will be discussed. Um, I have to say that uh, they're held in Melrose Hall, because I can fund those, so they are at no cost. Um, the help shop, which we opened for the information of residents in Hoylake, we had to move out of the shop because we couldn't get the funding. Uh, we moved into the library, which unfortunately wasn't a good idea because they were only open two days a week and there were so many things going on in the library that people couldn't get to see us. So we have now moved it to Melrose Hall and it will be there every morning um, and we've set up an office there. At the moment we're working on the Festival of Firsts and other community events, so we are very busy. One of our big concerns is the fact that with all the cuts that are coming, and all the uh, activities that are not going to be funded by the council anymore, we tend to take them over in our neck of the woods with volunteers. And we've been doing this for many years. Most of our 15 community groups in Hoylake and West Kirby have been founded on that reason. What is concerning us, not only now are we being expected to volunteer to do the job, but we've now got to raise the money to actually do the jobs that we're doing in place of the people who used to do them. And where the new volunteers are going to come from, we are extremely worried because the older generation are getting older and the younger generation are working longer. And so we are going to get in a catch-22 where we're not going to find people uh, to do the volunteer jobs that we are already doing in Hoylake and which is why so many people want to come and live there. One of our concerns at the moment is this clean for the Queen. And so many people have come to us to say that uh, it's a pity that Network Rail and everybody else doesn't get together and do something about the embankments on either side of the railway, which is the first thing of Wirral people see as they come through the tunnel. 
and I hope that the council and Network Rail are going to do something about that. We as residents will look after our own little areas, but I think there are major areas that need to go alongside that. So those are our concerns at the moment. Uh, pick it up from the Greasby Frank the only point of view. Thank you very much to Jeff for his kind words, which was you anticipated what I was about to say, which was to, to say this would be my last uh, time sitting here and I shall be in the audience in the future, so I shall feel much freer to say my own thing then. Um, the reason I am standing down is because I stood down as chairman of Greasby Nunti Association last month after 13 years and handed over to Wendy and we just uh, started off running, shall we say, um, but that I thought it was appropriate to, at this point to, to drop off the constituent committee. Just to very briefly say there are lots of good things going on at Greasby, um, people are working really well together. Um, I say thank you every morning to the Chief Fire Officer for proposing that a fire station should be built in Greasby 18 months ago because it's galvanised the community to come out and uh, do great things for itself um, and we've now got it all uh, thoroughly under control under uh, the community association's umbrella with lots of subgroups doing good things. The, the flies and the ointment are the library and the children's centre, both of which are on very fragile thin ice at the moment. Um, and we're still waiting, and I would perhaps appeal through this meeting for something from the library service. We've been waiting for several weeks for guidance from them as to what they're expecting in terms of community takeovers, community management, community working partnerships or whatever on the library. You really do need to know. Uh, as quickly as possible. It was promised a while ago. Let's not come through. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> I, I mean, it's a good point. It, I think it came across very clearly in the earlier item as well. You can't just do it and hope things you know, go well. You need to think about planning, think about consequences, think about the time it takes to mobilise people and so on and so forth. But things literally don't happen overnight. You need to plan and plan for the change. So I know James right in a way there, so we'll, uh, and I'm sure uh, the new chairman of the Greasby Community Association will be very clear and uh, very, very speedy in making sure that those views are brought to the attention of the powers that be in the council. So thank you for that. And, you know, John, we really are going to miss you. So, uh, so thank you for that. And I hope you're not going to feel too free to comment. Oh, I think you are. So, Okay, thank you for that. And again, you know, the work that volunteers do, I think you know, Jackie makes a, a great point, that there is this view that there is a limitless supply of volunteers, and there isn't, and people need help. You can't just throw something at people. They need help and support, guidance. Uh, or maybe not guidance, but certainly some, some resource to, to make these sort of things happen. So thank you for that, and let's hope... If we advertise effectively, and I would um, encourage all colleagues, because you, everyone will know people are doing an amazing job in their, in their communities, to, to think about coming forward and, uh, and joining the constituency committee. You know? um, I think, you know, and I uh, commend those people that make that service. Next item that we have is the Rural West Resident Feedback and Development of Constituency Business Case. But let, what we're going to have first is Kevin McCullen from the Marketing and Communications uh, branch to present the outcomes of the resident survey. And I think you're going to use this microphone, is that right? Oh, no, Helen's got one over there. Look at that, they're all over the place. Are we on now?
Um, what we did, why, why we did it, sorry, was because we've never actually done it properly before like that. We've always just done consultations on what people thought of specific budget proposals, what people thought about different developments that were going on in the area. We've never actually gone out to people since 2008 with a detailed piece of research asking them what was actually important to them, what they actually wanted, what they actually wanted to see happening in their local area, what was what needed improving, and just what, what was most important to their quality of life. It's there to make health members, health uh, council officers, make more informed decisions about what we're doing, about services, about where to, where to invest money, where to, how to develop things a bit, little bit further on. Um, this is the first stage of the results of those of that survey. And um, what is also available? Um, this is, as I say, this is going to be a snapshot, a bit of a whistle stop tour through the through the results. There's an 85, 86 page report, really detailed findings that are available on the council website. Now that's quite a dense report. Also next to the report, there's a video of um, a gentleman called Ben Page, who's the chief executive of Trust Money, who did a presentation to us um, to, um, in January, a couple of weeks, only a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago. So there's a video of that as well that you can watch. And he goes into an awful lot more detail about Wiggle as a whole. Um, I'll go through the methodology. Now one thing that this isn't is it's not a census. So you'll see the number at the top there, we've got 12. 1,200, I think the number final number ended up being 1,207 um, responses to the survey. Around about 300 came from this particular constituency. So obviously that's a tiny, represent, tiny, tiny number in terms of against, against the overall population. But we don't make apologies for that because as I said, this is market research. Um, the way you do market research is you select a sample and you, you make assumptions based on, based on that sample and you weight it according to the population. So the actual survey was sent out to a completely random sample of just under 6,000 households. Um, we got 12, just over 1,200 back and it's around about a 21% response rate, which is about right for something like this. Um, Molly, what Molly have also done, and you'll see it partly through this presentation, but more in the main one, is benchmarkers. So we've, got, we've been compared in this analysis against four different, four different authority areas across the UK. Now they're not um, regional neighbours, that's what's called the, it's called the nearest neighbour model, it's, um, it's the statistical neighbour. So it's based on the size of the population, the broad demographic breakdown, the um, economic profile of the area. So I think the closest one to us in the top ten I think is Sefton, um, in terms of the size and the makeup of the borough generally. Um, we've been compared against two anonymous authorities, who have trust money did their research for them, as well as Darlington and South End, which obviously miles away from here, but are very relatively similar in terms of the makeup. What we're doing now at the moment is uploading the, our, our information that we got back to what's called LG Inform, which is the local government database of all of these surveys. Hundreds of councils across the country every year do this kind of thing. So we'll, we compare them against national, uh, national comparators and we should get that back within a, within a couple of weeks, I would think. So initially, this won't come as a surprise for anybody. This is just m m what Molly lifted out as kind of top level feedback, top level breakdown between the differences of constituency. None of this is going to be a surprise to you. In Willow West, more homeowners, more, homeowners, more retirees, in Birkenhead, more social and private tenants, less healthy and higher unemployment. None of this will be a general surprise, but this is just the, the initial bit of broad feedback that Molly gave us. Um, if I start going into the actual, the main part of the data now, as I say, we've got just over 1,200 responses. Um, at, a, at a Willow level, that's really robust, um, because Molly, Molly, the general guidance nationally is that to make it a robust sample for a butter our size, you only need about 600 people to respond. And then you can, you can extrapolate that across the entire population and it'll give you a relatively good number. So we got twice that number. So Molly is saying to us that it's absolutely bang on in terms of, in terms of Whittle as a whole. When you get down to constituency level, and um, we break it down there, it obviously gets a little bit wobblier because we've got about 300 responses from this constituency. But if you go through it, I, I think a lot of the feedback that we got will probably ring true to you when it goes. So what this information here is, is where people are saying that something needs improving in the area that's different to, to, to the rest of the borough. So where something's a variation from the mean. What this is, this isn't saying that these are all big issues in a particular area. What it's saying is that they're a bigger issue in that constituency than they are in the rest of the borough. It's where something's jumping out as being slightly unusual in terms of, in terms of the level of feedback. So in Wallasey, job, job prospect, prospects and access to shops came out as more of an issue than anywhere else in the borough. Obviously, in terms of Birkenhead, we had 
six, different, six issues that came up was more of an issue in Birkenhead than you were anywhere else. In Willow West, traffic congestion was the one that came out as being more of an issue. I didn't really, that really, didn't really resonate with me. You'll know, you'll know better than me, but that, that came out. People expressed some surprise about that when we saw it. These were the top four priorities for people that came out right the way across the borough. Um, number one, now it's generally always low crime, low levels of crime and antisocial behaviour nationally gens tends to be always the number one priority when people say what's important, mo most important in making somewhere a good place to live. In Whittlewood, particularly in Birkenhead actually, that's higher than it usually is um, in, terms of, in terms of 57. It's usually in the 40s nationally based on the national averages. Um, clean environment, good education and good health. Good health services as well generally don't come in the top four nationally according to what Molly's told us about, about their analysis. So this is this is the worldwide picture of what are the top four. So crime, environment, education and health. We also asked people what they thought generally about the how satisfied were they with with place to, with Whittle as a place to live. The Whittle average for this question was 78, and I'll get to a bit of a, um, a scoring matrix at the end. Um, that's around about average, it's generally between 75 and 80 across the, across the country. But as you'll see, that, 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 there's a variation in that between, between constituencies with the lowest level of satisfaction with Will um, being in Birkenhead, the highest being here at 90%. 9 in 10 people saying that they're happy with the places with, with, with Will left as a place to live. What we also asked as well is we, when we've been talking about the, the most important things to make it a good place to live, Top five in Willow are on your left, and the top five in Willow, Willow West are on your right. So that just shows you the differences between 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 Willow as a whole and between Willow West. So as you'll see, low levels of crime and antisocial behaviour comes top across in, in both. Um, but it changes; the rest of the order seems to change in terms of health services. Comes out second in Willow West; it's down in fourth in the borough. Um, public transport networks um, come out as in the top five in Willow West and don't across the rest of the world. So that's where it's saying that it's more important to people in the West about, about public transport net networks. Similarly, um, what, needs, what, what most needs improvement, what are the biggest problems that need fixing in, in the area? Um, roads and pavements came up top <coughs> right away across the borough. Um, top here and top, top in Whittle generally. But in Whittle West it kind of changed, it changed quite a bit. Traffic congestion came there. Didn't come in the top seven or eight across, across Whittle which suggests that might just be a bit of an anomaly because as I said, the numbers were relative, you know, we were only talking about 300 people in this borough, but it came out from the top three, and whereas it's nowhere near even the top five across the rest of the borough. Streets and environment drops down to being slightly less important, and teenagers having the best, uh, uh, access to uh, activities and facilities is slightly more important to Willow West than the, than the rest of the borough combined. As I say, there's a, an awful lot more detail here behind all of, all of this information that's available on, on our website at the moment together with the, with the video pen. Um, what we also asked is a question about generally what was most important to residents in terms of the services that the council currently provides. So those, those are the top five priorities. Now you'll see that more or less that's exactly the same across, across both areas. There's just, a slight dif there's just a slight difference in the number four and number five. So Willow West and Will have got generally the same top priorities. That was a list of council services. What's most important to you is effectively that question. Bottom five are, again, relatively similar. Um, in the housing comes in the bottom five in both. Libraries, arts and museum, parks, sports and, rec sports and recreation comes across both. Now in terms of libraries, in terms of park and se parks, in terms of sports and recreation facilities, that's not unique to Will. Whenever we ask this kind of question, the way anyone in the country does this kind of survey, those three are usually in the bottom three. And that's because generally when people read that question, it's kind of in a push comes to shove list. If, you, if you've only got a couple of pounds left, what would you put it on? So naturally those three kind of drop. I don't think it's people saying it's not important, it's just saying other stuff slightly more. Um, services for children and young people came bottom in Willow West. It might be linked to the older nature of the demographic here possibly, but that, that came up bottom here it was relatively more important across the rest of the world. 
In terms of health and well-being, as I say, this is quite dense information, but you, I'd recommend anyone that's interested in this kind of thing to, to have a read of the Ipsos report that's online. Um, you've got one in three, um, one in three residents in Wales saying that they're they've got some kind of um, disability or health condition that's actually limiting their day-to-day -day activities. But at the same time, saying almost three quarters saying health is fairly good. Um, so that's almost contradictory, but it's, it's, it's still, there's elements of this that are still quite concerning. Um, in terms of the second bullet there, feeling safe and healthy are the most often, op most often call to make for a good quality of life. Feeling safe and um, low levels of crime, antisocial behaviour seems to be a theme that runs right away throughout all of the data that we collect through this process. Again, in Willow, what came out is that um, the significantly lower levels of people taking 150 minutes of, access, of exercise a week in Willow than the rest of the country, like 20% lower, um, which is which is a big a big variation, and, and I think that one that surprised quite a lot of certainly colleagues in public health that didn't expect that, but we were, we were way lower than what we should have been on that figure. And in terms of the economy, I don't think there's going to be a huge amount that's going to be surprising here, but in terms of you've got higher levels of worklessness in Wales and Birkenhead. Um, highest level of, of employment across the border seems to be in Wales South. Highest level of skilled employment across the border seems to be in Wales South as well. Um, according, according to the data we've collected here, again, it may be linked to, to, the, to the demographics rather than anything to do with the economy specifically. Um, in Wales, what you also seem to see as well is that the more likely a resident is to work in Will, the less likely they are to be in, to be in, to be in skilled or managerial positions. The majority of people working in Will seem to be in more entry level and, and manual positions, was what was coming out through this as well. So there's quite, the, there's quite a few, the, there's an awful lot of data to actually, to actually get into that it's, it's difficult to summarise in just a, a 10 minute presentation, but it's, as I say, there's an awful lot more information available. Um, finally, what I wanted to go through was, this is a bit of a dashboard, and this is kind of, it's almost kind of a brand for measurements for the council almost. Um, everybody asks this, every council that does this kind of survey asks, this, asks these questions. So it starts with um, satisfaction with the local area as a place to live. Um, as I say, Will is broadly in line um, in, terms, in terms of people being happy with where they live. We're on 78 here and you see the answers range from 79 to 75. Again, the satisfaction with the council is broadly thereabouts, lower than a few, but more or less thereabouts. Value for money were too low. Uh, people are saying people, that, that number is lower than what it should be. Um, we've got 36 there in one of the councils, but as I say, generally that should be 40 plus that number. So that's the, we're getting a lower, lower score there. And again, it doesn't translate, speaks positively at the council is, kind of, is, is the average question, and again, that's lower than it should be. Um, so there's generally, the rest of them were generally there or thereabouts. But as I say, there are a couple there that we are, that, that we are coming off lower than we should be really generally nationally according to national figures. But I say this is really heavily summarised and there's an awful lot more information there. And this is now being used, the data behind this is now being used to do a whole range of different things including budget setting process and various different plans and strategies that are being put together for, for cabinet. And we've also committed to repeating this research on an annual basis so you'll be able, you'll be able to track of, of most of the questions in there will be in there next year and you'll be able to track progress. Um, again, we'll, we'll come on to public questions, I'm sure. Um, so, thanks for that, Kev. Now, um, I know colleagues have seen this before, and we could get into a kind of, you know, part of the, um, sample sizes and so on. I think, I'm prepared to say it is what it is. Um, at the moment, as you said, there is that additional detail yeah. where people could go into it in in more detail and crunch their own numbers in, yeah. in, because there are I think as you pointed out some like real inconsistencies in there that, that need to be explored but the key thing for us around this and the 2020 element is developing our own um, rural west business case and I was going to ask Jane business case in terms of us taking more um, or having more influence over the services that impact us and so on. So I was going to ask Jane if you wanted to update us about how that the work on the business case is going, how we're using this resident insight to inform that, our local plan that we're developing off the back of it, and also the 2020 stuff as well. So 
I'll well, keep it very brief. There's not really very much to add other than what um, Chair has said there. There's two pieces of work that I am doing at the moment, and one of them is about looking at um, the role of the committee and how um, what areas um, we will be seeking to develop influence over as time progresses. Um, and the other part of, of the work is developing a constituency plan, which will be about local priorities and how we work collectively as partners to, to address those. And um, the distinct pieces of work, both of which we'll be able to bring back to the next committee in much more detail. But this um, resident site is very key to that, particularly the constituency plan. Um, we can start to explore, it, does, that, does that sit right with people, what local people tell us? I know from um, consultation we've done in previous years linked to our grant programme is that people feel very strongly about parks and open spaces, they feel very strongly about other things in, in Wirral West, and how does that tally really with how we move forward, so that's all we're looking for. Uh, but again, I'll bring a, a report on both of those things to the next committee, if that's okay. Well, so, thanks. Has anyone got any members of the committee? Have got anything they'd like to add to that? I think, um, again, we're all in the spirit of devolution, aren't we? So, government's devolving lots of things to the city region, um, the council is looking to devolve more things to the constituency committee um, and hopefully what Jane's doing is devolving more power and authority to, to individual residents and communities. There will be questions, question time at the section. All right. Um, okay, so thanks for that. So can we thank Kevin for the presentation and for Jane, no, the work Jane's doing on the constituency plan and business case. So thank you for that. Next item, and again, I know this has um, developed some local interest, so we were keen that we should um, try and cover this at the, um, at the committee, because we always like to be topical. Um, so uh, we've asked David Ball to come along, Head of Regeneration Planning, to give a verbal report on the outcome of the recent public consultation on the golf resort proposals. So um, away you go, David. Thank you, Chair. Just two things I'd like to talk to the committee about this evening. First of all, is the outcome of the drop-in sessions that were held in November and December of last year. And then secondly, just to outline the next steps for the golf resort and to give you some idea of the time scales that are involved. Excuse me. Um, as you recall, last November we held two drop-in sessions, one in West Kirby and one in Hoylake. Uh, to share with local people the initial concepts and the general principles of the Jack Nicholas Joint Venture Group proposals for the Hoylake Golf Resort. Um, we had a very high turnout for both of these events, uh, which was very good. We had over 600 um, representations and comments made uh, back to us through that process. Um, of the uh, people who responded, over 70% of the respondents either fully supported the scheme or supported the scheme uh, with some concerns. Uh, and there was about 29% of people who responded who didn't support the proposal at all. So that's about two thirds uh, in either fully support or support with some concerns. Um, a number of people made comments uh, about the benefits that they thought the golf resort might bring um, to the local area. Uh, to tourism generally in Wirral, to the economy and the jobs it would create. Uh, and there were a number of areas of concern also expressed relating to things like um, access to the golf resort, uh, the railway crossing at Hoylake, uh, environmental issues, ecology issues, the greenbelt issues and uh, the provision of housing uh, within the golf resort proposal. Uh, we've made all of the comments that were made um, uh, to us, uh, we've redacted personal information uh, for, for obvious reasons, but we've made all of those comments available on our website so you can have a look at all the detailed comments that were actually made to us. And what these will now do is inform the next stage of the process. Um, the next stage of the process.